After years in the doldrums, Coventry City soon became the talk of football, thanks mainly to Jimmy Hill. Well, I'd met the then chairman, Derek Robbins, at a social evening with uh, Jim Laker. I remember he, he knew Derek and I didn't beforehand, but he introduced me and we sat together and talked about football and football management and things like that. Uh, and I had no idea that at the back of his mind <laughs> after that evening, uh, he was thinking about me as the manager. But he did invite me to come up and be his guest and, and watch Coventry play in a cup tie against Kings Lynn. Um, which I did. I didn't actually sit in on the posh side where all the directors were. I sat on the other side and watched Coventry lose 2-1. And I thought, uh, my goodness, <laughs> you know, Kings Lynn, now where do they come from? <laughs> um, and uh, Derek also thought that that would be my complete loss of interest in wanting to manage Coventry City. Um, but it worked the other way uh, because you, you can't do any worse than that, <laughs> losing in the cup at home to a non-league side. So on that basis, I thought it was a wonderful time to start with Coventry low in the division, out of the cup, um, right at the bottom, um, because I could only, there was only one way to go. That was up. <laughs> it was my first full-time management job. Uh, so it, anything was exciting, um, really. And having been a player, uh, and um, knowing very little about it, because I, as a Fulham player, I wasn't anything to do with the management there. My coaching was just to do with getting the team to win matches on the field. So then suddenly to be, to be called boss, I mean, that was a funny thing for me, because it, it wasn't in my vocabulary. To, nobody was boss. Uh, and that's why I, di I didn't like it. And so I, I asked the players if they would call me J.H. Um, and that, I th it, in fact, it was someone that had suggested it as an idea. I've forgotten which one it was now. And I said, that sounds a very good idea. I'll, I'll be J.H. And I became, I still am J.H. George Curtis still quote, calls me J.H. John Sillett when I see him. Um, it's, it's quite weird. The past has overwhelmed us, as it were. After arriving as manager in 1961, he turned the whole club on its head, introducing the Sky Blue kit, a Sky Blue song, and most importantly, two promotions. Something was happening at last. We were a prospect of doing something, going somewhere. I mean, we hadn't been a bad team, but we just hadn't been doing anything very exciting or, or different or whatever. And uh, it needed him to light the blue touch paper, and then we all stood back and watched the rocket go up. <laughs> it, it really was an amazing time. You, you can't describe it. You can't describe it. Um, and although we get excitement here now, it still doesn't match what, what Jimmy Hill gave us. He was a great innovator and had terrific ideas and I, I understand different ideas in training as well um, and certainly did a fantastic job at Coventry City. Uh, they owe a lot to him. The atmosphere in the ground was, was electric because it helped because the club rarely lost at home. You know, it, in the period from, say, 1962 to 1967, the club only lost about eight or ten home games, if that. The actual sky blue thing, um, in fact I'm quite sure, came from probably Derek Henderson who was the local reporter in those days uh, and there was a headline that they used sky blue uh, because we had a new sky blue kit and the local paper, Coventry Evening Telegraph, uh, must take the credit for doing the first sky blue in print uh, and from there it caught on and it was perfect really for the uh, you know, for the purpose for which we went into Sky Blues, for people to know about Coventry City Football Club and that it was on its way up. He brought in the Sky Blues, he brought in the Sky Blues song, and uh, we all used to have a sing song on the coach, and uh, he would lead the singing, you know, he'd be standing there in the front conducting the boys all singing away. We actually wrote the words to um, Let's All Sing Together Play Up Sky Blues on a Saturday evening when John Campkin, who was then a director, and he did commentary uh, on other football club matches. Uh, and he came home on the Saturday night and, and we said, we haven't got a song. What are we going to do about it? And um, we, we, I said, well, um, you know, the Eaton Boating songs, <laughs> it's, it's a nice, I've always thought that was a <laughs> pleasant little singable uh, lyric, shall we say. Um, but why don't we do our own lyrics? So the two of us, um, over a bottle of wine, um, sat down and wrote Sky Blue song. Let's all sing together, play up Sky Blues. While we sing together, we will never lose. 
Let's all sing together, play up sky blues. While we sing together, we will never lose. Let's all sing together, play up sky blues. Pro, posh or Tottenham, united or anyone. They won't defeat us, we'll fight till the game's won. And everybody will be singing it to their heart's content, you know. Great. And it's a wonder that nobody in the league didn't complain that we were getting a special advantage from our crowd and not giving the visitors the, the reception they deserved and that it, they were not playing on an even keel. With the likes of George Curtis, John Sillett, Bill Glazier, George Hudson and Ian Gibson in the side, Coventry soon became a force. Suddenly I get a phone call from a James Hill who had just taken over his first manager's job at uh, Coventry who said to me, John, you're going to be my first signing. I remember coming up the M1, which had just opened, and uh, my brother had come with me. We were playing Burnley in a festival match, it was, and uh, friendly for the cathedral. And uh, I arrived, and when I saw the ground, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't get my breath. I said, what have I done, Pete? He said, well, come on. He said, it'll be all right. Let's go and look at the pitch. Well, when we looked at the pitch, it was on a big slope. And I said, I, don't know, I need one league longer than the other one to play here. And I looked at Jimmy, I said, what have you done to me? He said, it's all going to be changed. He said, by the time this season ends, you come back next season for pre-season training, it'll all be changed. And sure enough, right to his word, it had all changed. It was Jimmy Hill and together with the chairman, Derek Robbins, who instigated almost like a, a clean sweep of the stadium. And in five years, they put up three brand new stands. They reached the FA Cup sixth round in 1963 as a third division side, and only eventual winners Manchester United were able to stop their momentum. But it was their success in the league that made everyone sit up and take notice. The third division championship in 1964 was soon followed by the second division title in 1967. A record crowd of over 51,000 packed into Highfield Road to watch Coventry clinch that title against Wolves. That was an extraordinary afternoon. I mean, it's an unforgettable one. It wasn't only an afternoon because we didn't go to bed early that night. I watched the game from on the terrace and in front of the Sky Blue stand. Uh, 51,455 people crammed in here and they were literally everywhere. They were on top of the stand roofs. They were on, climbed up the floodlight pylons. They were on top of the little bars that was placed on the uh, spine cot on the roofs. Well, I, I always used to stand on a, a, a stool that uh, was my uh, granddad's, and uh, I was stood there over at the spine cot end. And as the crowd got bigger and bigger, I was gradually being moved away from a stool, and I was being shifted down and supported miles from a stool. Uh, but to have 51 and a half thousand people in at a stadium that, uh, you know, I look at the crowds these days, 14,000, 15,000, and you wonder where they all come from. Um, but it really was a, um, a most exciting occasion. We let the kids come down uh, on the side of the pitch, basically, so that, um, well, we had to because there were so many people and it's not the biggest ground in the world. They took me above the heads, carried me down onto the pitch, and I sat watching the match from the pitch side. And honestly, don't remember much about the game. I was more worried about my dad <laughs> standing behind me. And you know, it was called the Spion Cop, like many sort of bank terraces around the, the country were in those days. I remember walking up outside the streets and the crowds that were building up, and I got a little bit frightened because I was only down there and people were walking past who were up there. And I got a little frightened, but my dad quietened down. He said, "You wait, wait till we get on the ground." He says and I'll put you on one of the barriers. That, that was the barriers there. And you'll be able to see the game. Because I was, I was worried that I, I wasn't tall enough to see what was going on. And uh, we did, we got on the ground and I got on to, onto this barrier. And I was sure it was Northampton Town that we played. Uh, but I know we won. And that got, got me going, I was happy. We were, Coventry won. The years leading up to World War II saw a big improvement on and off the pitch at Highfield Road. Clary Borton was the darling of the Coventry fans. His goals helped Coventry win promotion to the second division in 1936, while off the pitch the ground itself was starting to take shape. As a result of winning promotion, they put in train the building of a new stand to replace the original uh, 1899 grandstand. 
and that was that was called the main stand. There was, the houses at the back where they used to open the shutters up and you're going to get a cup of tea. Well, when they built this big stand and they stopped that game, the chaps used to walk around with tanks on the back with a pump on it and they used to fill it up for tuppence, plastic cups. Gates were high, uh, they were averaging over 20,000 and um, each, each of the next three summers they carried out additional work on the stadium. They uh, put in more terracing at the, at the cop end. Um, they built what was known by many fans as the crow's nest up in the one corner of the spine cop. And they, um, they then built a canopy on the main stand because too many fans were complaining they were getting wet. There was a wooden stand here and at the top end of the football ground, that was like a cow shed. It was just a cover, that's all there was there. And of course the spy and cop was there and that's where we used to stand on the spy and cop. It used to come sometimes two hours before a game because I'm being small, I'd got to have a spot and the steps went down and I used to stand on the end of the step. I'm standing on spy and cop one game when some bloke got excited and somebody nearly scored and he kicked out with his right foot and kicked somebody up the rear end because that caused a bit of a commotion. <laughs> this bloke wanted to start a fight and the, uh, my, my father was about five foot ten, seventeen stone and he just turned around and said, Look, be quiet or she'll be in the hospital. <laughs> Clary Borton um, was, was the finest centre forward that Coventry City ever had. His goal scoring record was second to none. He scored 172 goals in, in five seasons. He was an absolute idol. He, he, and he was brilliant in the air, but he was also very good on the ground. But, but we had two good wingers then who could go down the line, put the crosses over, and Chuck Clary would be there to put the finishing touches to him. World War II pretty much brought an end to competitive football in England, but games were still being played at Highfield Road. That was until the ground, like most of the city, was severely bombed in 1940. Although Highfield Road was patched up, it wasn't until 1942 that friendlies were again staged there. I'm right in saying that uh, it took a couple of bombs during the war. And it never really got it, just after the war, it never really got the, the flow that you got. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's beautiful, that is. You can play snooker on that. But uh, you couldn't play with it like that. Either. And it was, you, you, your boots, the boots were different, the ball was different, the ball was leather. If you got, uh, if you got rain and you got mud on it, it stayed on it, it didn't come off like it did now. You headed the ball and you headed the lace. Oh. There were a couple of big holes in the pitch. Um, there was uh, a crater in, on the terraces at the, at the, at the, at the west end. Um, and football had to be halted there. And there was no games. There were no games played for almost two years um, until they could afford to put put right the damage. In the war time, Billy Morgan and Charlie Elliott. I was in the AFS then, and they were firemen at the sta at the central station. And because they kidded you like mad, you know, especially Billy. He was a great man. My uh, father one Saturday brought me along to this stadium. And what a, a welcome it was. I was flabbergasted. There was 29,000 people. It was a local derby against Birmingham. And it was just, just couldn't get over it. I was, uh, the, 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 the football ball hit me there and then. This was something for me. This atmosphere was fantastic. The post-war years started off pretty well for Coventry, but after knocking on the door of promotion to the first division, they were relegated to the third division in 1952. They continued to make ground improvements, however, and for some people, it was a joy just to have a chance to play at Highfield Road. It's my first game for the first team, so I'm sitting in the dressing room 15 minutes before the kick-off, getting changed. And the tannoy comes on, team changes. For number nine, instead of Ted Roberts, Jack Evans. And what did I hear? Oh. And I'm sitting in the dressing room and I've listened to that, all of them, that, oh. That was it. That was a good start, that was, wasn't it? But uh, it all ended well. I got the winning goal, so that was it. I got the goal that end. Cross from Leslie Warner from there, nodded in. So that was it. What was that like? Brilliant. I got a stand innovation coming off, which was pl very pleasant, very pleasant. Yes, it was. It was. That was my ten minutes of uh, glory, that was, yeah. 
Well, the ground didn't really change very much from the war right through to the, the, the early 1960s. Um, the, the, the major development was really in floodlights, and Coventry City installed their first floodlights, which were literally um, lamps on wooden poles around the pitch uh, in 1953. Also in 1957, the Supporters Club uh, raised money uh, for the uh, building of um, uh, new floodlight pylons. Uh, it was a new floodlighting system. Uh, it cost £15,000 uh, and they replaced uh, the original floodlighting system. Those floodlights actually lasted right through to um, 1993. But the thing about Highfield Road, for me, was the fact that football at Coventry City kept me very fit. Because at eight years old, we used to go down the town in the morning for the pictures, and run there and run back, and I used to live at the other side of the city. And then in the afternoon, we'd, after shoveling our dinner down, we'd run down here and run back after the game. And I used to sit in, over there in the corner by uh, the sparring cop, leaning on the wall, because the wall was low enough for us. And it was just uh, an exciting time to come and be with all the grown-ups, because we didn't have to bring our parents, we could come and enjoy ourselves. and then buy buns and things on the way home with the bus fare we'd save because we'd run both ways. You know, you didn't have cars in those days. You got the bus and then you walked from town all the way up, just mixed in with the crowds and walked up with them. We pay at the turnstiles. There was no season tickets or anything in those days. You just paid at the turnstiles and went in. A very uneven pitch. There was a drop from one side to the other of about 12 foot. Uh, the terraces were nearly all open. The grandstands were antiquated. But it was just atmosphere. It was it was great to be here. It's a bit of a dump really, it's all sheds and I so said the only, only exciting thing was the meat pie really. Coventry City called this place home for 106 years before that final whistle at their championship game with Derby County in April 2005. That signalled an emotional end to an era and a move to a 32,000 all-seater super arena. The club's playing days at Highfield Road may be gone, but the memories of their famous old home will last forever. The ground saw its fair share of great goals, world-class stars, charismatic managers, and of course, plenty of drama. Highfield Road wasn't Coventry City's first home, in fact it wasn't even its second. The club started life as Singers FC, formed by cycle workers from the factory of the same name. In 1883, their first pitch was located on Dowell's Field, near where the Gosford Park Hotel is currently located on St George's Road. They used to, they used to use the, uh, the White Lion at Gosford Green as the club headquarters. And as far as I know, they, they, they used that as the, as the changing rooms and would trot across from the pub to, to, to the field. That pitch would have been almost like a farmer's field. Uh, with no no turnstiles or gates, it was just a, um, a a pitch on a field, and they probably uh, went round and collected tuppence from everybody who was standing round in a hat. Singer spent just four years at Dowell's Field before moving to a new enclosed ground called Stoke Road in 1887. This was just south of the Highfield Road ground, with the club's headquarters being based at the Binley Oak Pub in Payne's Lane. The Stoke Road ground, they were there about 12 years um, and it, it gradually developed um, but it wasn't very sophisticated. I think even at the end they had maybe a small grandstand, a couple of hundred people, they had wire around the pitch, they had hedges um, so that they could actually uh, control the, uh, the, the fans, the spectators coming in and, and take money off them. Uh, but it wasn't very sophisticated. But having said that, you know, you've got to remember that Coventry City in that, at that time were in the, the Birmingham League, Birmingham Junior League, 
which was a very, very sort of lowly league. Um, so the expectations of a, of a, a grand stadium weren't really there. Changes came thick and fast for the club around the turn of the century. They changed their name from Singers to Coventry City in 1898 and a year later they moved to the ground that would become their home for the next 106 years. Highfield Road in the 1890s was a far cry from the ground that Coventry are leaving behind. The area they moved to was actually um, a cricket pitch um, with a row of elm trees across the site almost exactly where the halfway line is at Typhill Road now. And the first job they had to do was remove those elm trees and then they had to level the pitch, relay the turf and um, uh, go about preparing a, a pitch. I hate to use the word stadium because it wasn't a stadium, it was a, it was a ground. But they had an enclosure, they had, a ba they had banking on three sides of the, of the pitch and on the site of the main stand now, they had the first stand, which held uh, around about 2,000 spectators. It impressed a lot of people, and the stand, um, the stand was impressive when you walked up, when you walked up Highfield Road, because that was the way, that was the only the only street that was built around that area at the time. That's why it, that's why the ground was called Highfield Road. People, would, people coming from the city centre region would, would walk up Highfield Road and they would see uh, across the, the pitch, they would see the stand in front of them. The early part of the 20th century saw Coventry elected to the Southern League as they started to make a name for themselves in the FA Cup. A record crowd of more than 19,000 saw them lose to Everton in the quarter-finals of that competition. The gate receipts from that cup run enabled them to build a new grandstand on the north side of the ground. That would remain in place until 1964. They obviously made some good money. I think the receipts for the Everton game alone were £1,000, which was, you know, would be in today's terms, would probably be like a half a million pounds. And with the money they, they made from the cup run, they, they built a second grandstand on the opposite side, on the site of the current sky blue stand um, and that was a bit more impressive than the the old stand it, it I think it, it held about two and a half thousand people um, and they did some terracing work on the on the um, on the ground they built a fence around the around the pitch and um, uh, generally spent a bit of money tidying things up the years after World War I were rather turbulent for Coventry. They were elected to the Football League, but struggled to cope with a step up in class. The crowds continued to still turn up, however, and the ground's record gate was broken on many occasions. Times were changing at Highfield Road. They bought a, an old stand from a Twickenham rugby, rugby Stadium, a rugby ground, and they, um, they transported it to, to Highfield Road and just used the roof uh, as a cover for the uh, what, what is now the west the west stand the west end of the ground, um, and they discovered when they were erecting it that there was a massive slope from one side to another. So they had to do some hasty um, ha hasty engineering to uh, make this roof fit over the over the terrace or over the over that end of the pitch. Uh, Coventry City had all, always played uh, in blue and white and in 1922 they decided to change to the civic colours, the city civic colours of green and red. In the close season of 1922, Herbert Kendall and 25 volunteers from the supporters club actually came to the ground uh, during the summer holidays and uh, facilitated uh, a lot of ground improvements which included uh, the renovation of turnstiles, they more or less completely painted every stand uh, and fence in the ground, green and red. In the mid-1920s, they did remove, or they did move a lot of earth and rubble from the building of the Coventry tramways um, to Highfield Road and built up the, the, the cop end, which was the, the Swan Lane end of the ground. So that made it a much bigger bank than the other sides of the pitch.
and uh, it, it made such an atmosphere for the game. And of course, um, yeah, with a little help from above, we didn't lose it <laughs> in those circumstances. I mean, Wolverhampton you know, were a much bigger club than Coventry in those days, and uh, they had brought masses of people over uh, expecting to be able to see the game. And they all did see the game, 51,500 people. I mean, you could have killed for a ticket. And uh, it, the ground was absolutely jam-packed. Um, and the atmosphere, I mean, you couldn't be, and that, when, we'd, when we'd won the game and, and we knew we were going up, I mean, I've never felt a feeling like that before. It was the sort of thing in weak, weak, weak people would have induced a heart attack, you know. <laughs> but it carried us for months afterwards, that did, you know. We were so excited about seeing the big teams and meeting the big boys, who we used to beat in, in the Premier, Premier League and First Division. It was the bread and butter sides that we had trouble with, but we used to give the, the big teams, always gave them a good game. The Jimmy Hill era lasted six years. He resigned to join ITV Sport in 1967. Despite the shock of losing an inspirational leader, the club would stay in the top league for another 34 years and they made further improvements to the ground in 1968, although they hadn't planned to before a fire gutted the main stand. During that first season in the first division, in March there was a, a major fire at the stadium and the, the main stand, the 1936 main stand, uh, was burnt down, or substantially burnt down, um, after a, um, a fire. Now the fire was caused by, there was a, a reserve game on one evening, and the, the theory is that a cigarette, a, a lighted cigarette, fell down between the, the wooden seats uh, and start and burnt the rubbish that had accumulated over many years and created quite you know quite a, a big fire. The difficulty was um, underneath the stand was a suite of offices, storerooms and so on and uh, the fire had started there and spread up into the stand so we had to get into the stand itself and tackle the fire which was very difficult. It was a bit of a wreck. Um, the main damage you could see from uh, where we were, were the, the seating area. Around about a third to a half of the seating area was destroyed. And of course all the offices and storerooms underneath the stand as well was destroyed. One of the members of staff did come up to us um, during the fire and wanted to know if uh, any of the cups had been destroyed and we said no, the fire hadn't reached the kitchen. The problem was, in ten, ten days time, they had Manchester United arriving for the biggest, one of the biggest games in the club's history. And somehow they managed to patch up with some scaffolding and what have you, patch up that stand so that the, that the patrons could be seated. And um, 10 days later, they had 47,000 in the ground, the second biggest gate in the club's history. When I first arrived, um, of course, there was just a blank space there where the stand had been. And so I, on my first two weeks there with the agency, worked in a caravan. Um, in front of this sky blue stand because of course there was no office space um, but then when I worked, went back on a full-time basis um, we had a house at the end of King Richard Street um, I started off in a bedroom and then I moved down to the kitchen um, where you know where Neil's office was Neil Solomon's office and from there watched the new stand going up. That summer they decided to demolish the the remainder of the stand and rebuild it, uh, rebuild a new main stand. Again they did it over the close season and it was ready. I think they had to, they had to postpone two games, two home games, um, to enable the stand to be finished. Oh it was amazing, yes. I mean you used to used to arrive in the morning and there was a little bit more added to it and in no time at all it was finished. It was wonderful. And to actually then move into proper offices after being in a caravan and a, and a little house, it was just wonderful. There was so much space we didn't want to do with ourselves. The 70s were almost as dramatic as the 60s. Coventry would clinch a place in Europe and even beat Bayern Munich at Highfield Road, albeit after a 6-1 defeat in Germany in the first leg of their second round Fairs Cup match. The decade started with a bang as Willie Carr set up Ernie Hunt for arguably the best goal ever scored at Highfield Road, the infamous donkey kick. <laughs> Couldn't believe what he'd done, you know. No one's done it really, I don't think anyone's done it since. We couldn't believe what we'd seen and it was only really afterwards that we realised that this was a, uh, an epic uh, moment in the life of football at Coventry. Absolutely, absolute amazement.
I mean, because he was a cheeky player. He was always a cheeky bloke. If he was on tele if talking on television on the radio, you could see the humour coming through, you know. And for him to do a cheeky thing like flicking the ball up like that and, and for it to be whipped into the net was, was absolutely... We, we, we couldn't believe it, you know. It's one of those things that you, you sort of rerun in your mind over and over again. And I, I dare say, if he did it another hundred times, it wouldn't have gone in again. I was behind the goal when that was scored. Um, when they actually took the kick, we wondered what they were doing because Willie Carr stood over the ball with his feet either side of the ball. And you think, what's he doing? And he flicks it up and when it went in, amazing, absolutely amazing. And I think the really, really sort of uh, amazing thing to me is that they, afterwards, they said that they took it in train and didn't score one. And it just, boom, straight over the top, straight in the, in the, in the far corner, and, and the place just erupted. You know, it's all these one-off things, and it, it, just, it just worked, and it was absolutely ma magical. My first memory of uh, Highfield Road is, uh, is walking up these steps here, and uh, the last few steps before uh, coming out to, uh, to look at the ground. And... Um, uh, the sunshine starts to sort of filter down the uh, stairway there and uh, as I came over the top uh, I just remember looking out absolutely astonished that it was in colour because uh, we'd only ever had um, black and white telly at home and I'd only ever seen football match of the day um, uh, in black and white and uh, you know the pitch was green, the sky was blue, it was August, it was sunny uh, the players were all warming up, both teams and the supporters everywhere. It was just fantastic. It was uh, it was in colour, and that was my first memory of Firefield Road, 35 years ago, and uh, been hooked ever since. My favourite player of all time was uh, Tommy Hutchinson, um, and uh, he was uh, so silky smooth with his uh, with his skills, and uh, you know razzle dazzle Tommy was the uh, was the cry that went up, and. Uh, I haven't seen uh, very many players that, uh, uh, that show that kind of uh, class on a football pitch. Oh, he's a wizard with a ball. Yeah, wizard he was. Yeah. He was a good winger and he could outrun anybody, I reckon, in them days. He used to love Tommy. Not a little whippet he was. Well, a big whippet, really. <laughs> you know. When I came here, we were bottom of the league. We went 14 games in the trot without losing. And from then on, uh, not only the first team, but the youth team did really well. And I think the year that I left, even all the, I think it was about 12 or 14 of the first day of the youth team actually went on to play in the first division. The main one that, that stands out for me is when we, uh, we played here, we played Liverpool, and that night we went top of the league, um, beat them 1-0, I scored the goal, and uh, I think it was only the goal I scored that season, mind, but um, I, I think that was, a, that was a big doing in me actually being picked to play for Scotland. And I think at the time when I played here, for me to get picked for Scotland was like winning the lottery without buying a ticket. Give him the ball and he would, he could guarantee he would get the ball across and uh, the number of chances that he created and the goals he scored himself. Great player. He got the ball and, and you know, everyone stood up immediately. He didn't, if it could be in our penalty area, it didn't matter. Tommy's got the ball and, you know, and he, he could just beat players for fun. Like, well, I just, you don't really get them anymore, do you? You know. Um, but like, probably like I guess the Ronaldo of his times in a way. It was just fantastic to watch and uh, always delivered. When well, you had Mick Ferguson in the box and I'll get down to here, Wallace, you know. I think we even finished sixth on the year. I think it took a little while for the, for, for the crowd to come round to the way I used to play. Um, I don't think they took to me instantly. I think eventually, I think it was probably when Ian Wallace came along and we struck up a, a, a reasonable partnership um, that I think they finally got to understand in my type of game, my strengths if you like, and, and not always honing in on what might have necessarily been your weaknesses. Wally just seemed to know where I was going to put the ball and I just seemed to know where Wally was going to be. And it just sort of, it just spiralled from there. And I remember the pitch was always fantastic. The groundsman was always really good. And it was one of the best pitches in the league. And it, 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 all of the time, even when I played there as a professional and went on to play a lot of games, um, I always felt the Highfield Road surface was always fantastic. The prodigal son returned in 1975 when Jimmy Hill came back to Highfield Road as a director. Five years later, he was chairman and made the controversial move of turning Highfield Road into an all-seater stadium. It's harder to be a hooligan sitting down 
That was a phrase that I invented and in selling it to people who were against it and suspicious of it and worried how much it was going to cost, I was never in any doubt that it was the thing to do. I mean, some things you do in life and you know you're taking a chance. Sometimes you put a bit of money on a horse and you think it's going to win and it doesn't. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't have any doubts that that was the way in which football had to go. I think the club, when I came here, and even going to other clubs, uh, they were put, he was, his thinking was probably ten years ahead of everybody else with the changing rooms, with the dressing rooms, uh, with the uh, training facilities, uh, with the way that we travelled, uh, with the, the, the kit and equipment that we had. Uh, even down to the kids and how we, we looked after the kids, even as senior players, we had to mix with the, with the youth with the youth kids and we had a great, I think we probably were one of the first ones that had a hostel actually on the ground, so the kids had somewhere to come, it wasn't a case of getting stuck in digs somewhere. The early part of the 80s would prove a tense time for Coventry, as last day wins to avoid relegation became a regular occurrence, including a 4-1 over champions Everton in 1985. Well, they were highly pressurised, as you can imagine. Um, the first time I was here, 84, 85, we had to win the last three to stay up. And we've never, ever done that. It was incredible performance. Uh, we won at uh, Stoke away, Luton here and Everton at home. Uh, and the pressure's on. I mean, been in the, been in the championship in the top flight for th nearly 30 years. The atmosphere after the game was just relief and just unbelievable that they'd annihilated the champions and Everton had a really good side out. Um, it's just fantastic. My best memory is um, we beat Everton 4-1, our last game of, I think, 84 season, and we had, to, we had to win four in a row to stay up, and we won them all three, and then Everton were the champions, came down here, and uh, we beat them 4-1, it was fantastic, it was sunny, it was April, you know, they were already champions, and, uh, and we invaded the pitch, which was the only time I've ever done it. But it was the days when they had the fencing and, and the paint across the top, so we all got covered in pink paint and things like that. But no one cared at the time. It was just, um, yeah, that was fantastic. There were some good performances by the lads, really, in that match. They needed to be, but at the same time, you know, it was a hard match. Hard match to sit and suffer. I promise you, as a supporter, I hated every minute of it until the final whistle. I remember the, the fans' reactions, the players' reactions. It was almost as if we'd won something at the end of it. We'd only just staved off relegation. We should have been hard in the faces, really. But it really was as if we'd you know, got promoted or won something. Such was the excitement that, uh, you know, that there was at the time. Coventry City were making the headlines for all the right reasons in 1987, however, as Highfield Road was transplanted to Wembley for an historic afternoon. Everyone was like round the road here and all camped out in tents and stuff waiting to get um, the tickets for the FA Cup final. I looked at it and I thought, yeah, we're going to win a cup. That's what I stated and it was all in the press. So it says he'll win the cup. I didn't mean that cup. I didn't mean the FA Cup. I meant the Leamington Hospital Cup because we won it every year we played it. <laughs> Trying to be smart, I like turned around and uh, I've been sort of stuck with my own words. And from there on in, I thought, right, we'll show them we can win a cup. People don't believe me. I've watched it four times. That's all. Because I want to keep the memories without having to look back at them. Mm. And I'm the proudest moment of my life. And you hear Kill Klein and Captain behind us, should we let the fact that they'll go out on his own? You know, you hear those sort of things going on. And great, great moments to walk out on Wembley and to hear the crowd, the roar is deafening. We actually warmed up in the tunnel in them days, you weren't allowed out on the pitch to do your warm-up. So the first time you actually went out for the crowd proper was to go out and do the match. And as you kind of broke from the tunnel, you break into that brilliant sunshine and that colour and that noise and uh, mind-blowing, fantastic memories. I think we had thir uh, well, three quarters of uh, the ground were full with Coventry fans, I think, that day. So it's, uh, you know, it's like a home match for us, really, in a way. You know, I think obviously the neutrals were supporting us as well because uh, we were the underdogs, I think. And, you know, and it went a long way, you know, to, to helping us, I think, having that support. The stadium was ablaze and the sky blue. Uh, everybody, you know, that could get a ticket got one. Uh, I, I would have thought all the black market tickets went to sky blue fans. And uh, it was a terrific day, you know, especially when you bear in mind that we, we went down. I think we were losing, you know, twice in the game and ended up winning 3-2. You know, it did go down as probably one of the uh, best cup finals of the era. No, I remember looking up. And I said a little prayer to my mother. I said, Mum, we've made it. You hold them for 20 minutes. 
and the game starts in two minutes you're gonna go down and big george looked at me he said what do we do now sir i said if i had a drink i would take it if not i've got great belief in these players george they'll get back in the game they'll win us this game don't worry just sit there and relax I must admit, I was lying at the time because <laughs> I thought, God, it could be seven. <laughs> Come on, those, don't let us down. I used to say, why has Margaret Thatcher chosen Coventry City as the training ground for British astronauts? The answer is because it's got no atmosphere. And I used to get well booed when there were Coventry supporters uh, present, but as soon as they won the FA Cup, I had to drop it from my act. The 90s saw further improvements at Highfield Road. The East Stand rose up out of the demolished Spy and Cop at a cost of four million pounds. When Hooky went, I kept going past. Stop, just pass, stop. That was a fantastic night. Um, the Saturday before, we just beat Spurs 2-1 to stay in the Premiership. Um, we kept, on the Monday, the sort of tickets were on sale for the, uh, the testimony, which was on Friday, the 16th of May, 1997, and, and they were queuing, they were queuing round the ground to get tickets, and it was it was unheard of before for um, a testimonial match to actually be sold out before the actual night, because most fans turn up on the night and play, but it was actually sold out before. It was just typical of the, the Coventry supporters. Um, they, they just. You know, it was an unfortunate accident which happened to me, but you know, I think because of the type of player I was and that, you know, the down to earth lad and things like that, they just sort of took to me a bit. And uh, you know, on that night to come out, I mean, it was, it was raining for most of the evening, but it didn't dampen any of their spirit or anything. And they, they were cheering when we did the lap of honour, you know, I think we had to do three in the end because, it, you know, it, it just carried on and on and on. It was, it was just tremendous. And obviously, you know, we United being a, a big side down as well, it, was, it just added to the whole occasion sort of five or ten yards inside my own half and I just picked up and ran with it and kept going and no one came near me and in the end I just hit it and to be fair you don't really know where they're going to go you can only hope you smack one and it goes in the goal I mean if, if I'd have missed and I'd have had hooks and no wheel and cane in me because I could I should really have passed it to one of them and thankfully it flew in the top corner and you know we, we were on our way that was a you know a really good memory of Fife Road. I mean, it's a terrific, it was a terrific little stadium, and there was, you know, it just felt very homely. I think you get too many of these new super stadiums that just feel so cold and lack, lack any spirit or atmosphere. Um, but Highfield Road is one of the, the few grounds that, you know, st unfortunately, it's now going to go, but that actually re retained that sort of spirit. Gordon Strachan was manager at the time. I think I played, uh, I just played Arsenal and Liverpool the first team. Magnus Edmund had been injured. I announced I was going to retire. And uh, Gordon very kindly says, Well, listen, last game of the season is yours. You, you're playing, come what may. You know, he didn't have to do that. And uh, I thought it was a great gesture from the manager because uh, I didn't really expect it from him. So uh, he put me in against Sheffield Wednesday, which was nice. And I was desperate, desperate for us to win, desperate for things to go well, desperate not to look an idiot. I was 42 by that time. Uh, you know, but uh, I enjoyed it and again there was an enormous crowd on the day and they were just absolutely magnificent. It was the best send-off anybody could ever have and, and really, you know, I spent, uh, spent 17 or 18 years playing for the club, played just over 600 games and it really was the greatest send-off that you could ever have and, and the boys were great that day uh, and they made sure that A.I. didn't get a great deal to do and, and we managed to win the game 4-1 which, uh, which made everything absolutely perfect really. I started with the crew when we started the crew, if you like, in August 1994 with my wife. And in August 1996, we made our first appearance here at Highfield Road in the game against Nottingham Forest in the Premiership. And since then, we've attended every game, also many reserve games and pre-season friendlies, what have you sort of thing. And at the last game of the season, the Derby County game, that will be our 260th game here. You just get a really like great buzz off it with everybody cheering you on and watching you. And you want to go on again after you've been on. It's really good the way that you know that people are watching and they're taking notice of what you're doing. Even though, even if you go wrong, it's quite funny to know that they laugh at you because it knows that they're watching. I used to come with my mum when I was younger and I used to think I really want to dance in that pitch one day because I was always looking forward, like, I was always dancing when I was little, since I was four, so 
I always thought one day I hope I'll be on that pitch and here I am, so it's really good. We don't get many internationals on our side. And it's, it's, that was a big, big, it's a sad day when he went. I think Coventry City do it on purpose. Every year they nearly get relegated. So they're the only club in the country that can fill the stadium for the last two or three matches. I mean, they've been brilliant. Extremely sad today because uh, my dad used to sit up in the front row there, sat there for 40, 40 odd years, and fortunately he died a fortnight ago. And at Christmas he said, Whatever happens, I'm going to make it to the last one. And unfortunately he didn't, so I'm a little bit choked on for that reason. Um, but happy as well because we're moving on. It's, it's forward, isn't it? Special day today because we're coming up from here for over 40 years. and. Yeah, it's an important day. Not only uh, to stay in this league, which is vital, I think, before we go to the new stadium, but a uh, lot of memories, a lot of memories. New stadium, new beginning for us, hopefully. Hopefully, we can start moving up now. We'll do something next year with the new stadium, get a few fans in there, like we are today, and that. Nice sell out again, we need a bit more of it. And hopefully, it's a new beginning for the club. And we're going to be back here again every again, are we? You know, so we've got to make the most of it. He was nearly crying on the way up. And the memories will always be there. Highfield Road will be history, but you know, like I say, it's got to, it'll always have a big, big place in, in Coventry's history. There's no doubt about that. And I'm sure the new stadium, you know, that that, that is progress. And I'm sure that. It's, it's going to be bigger, it's a, it's a magnificent design, everybody's seen it and I know that people can't wait to get in there and uh, hopefully that will take the club to, you know, to, a, to a bigger level, to a higher stage even. There's a lot of history here and it's good memories and no one's going to forget this place and uh, we just want to make sure that the, the new ground, you know, we create the same atmosphere as what you know, this old ground does and uh, it's going to be hard to match it but hopefully uh, you know, a new spirit will be born and uh, we can go onwards and upwards. A great time, it's a very sad day for me, that day we leave Highfield Road, because I had some wonderful, wonderful times there. The way I look upon it with Coventry is there are, we should have the happy memories of Highfield Road without any doubt. You can't take those away from people. Uh, but on the other hand, in moving into another era where we're looking for Coventry to be in Europe, so on that basis it's part of the life, part of the history, um, all that I hope is that the team wins more matches on the ground it's going to than they won on the one on which they're leaving. And I don't mind if they break my record there.